capitalist and the laborer must clasp hands across the bottomless pit into which so much wealth and work has been cast. How this reconciliation is to be effected is a question that is occupying the minds of many wise and good men on both sides at the present time. Wise and impartial legislation will no doubt be an important agent in restraining blind passion and protecting all classes from insatiable greed, and it is the duty of every man to use his best endeavors to secure such legislation both in state and national governments. Organizations of laborers for protecting their own rights and securing a better reward for their labor will have a great influence. That influence will continue to increase as their temper becomes normal and firm, and their demands are based on justice and humanity. Violence and threats will affect no good. Dynamite, whether in the form of explosives or the more destructive force of fierce and reckless passion, will heal no wounds nor subdue any hostile feeling. Arbitration is, doubtless, the wisest and most practicable means now available to bring about amicable relations between these hostile parties and secure justice to both. Giving the laborer a share in the profits of the business has worked well in some cases, but it is attended with great practical difficulties which require more wisdom, self-control, and genuine regard for the common interests of both parties than often can be found. Many devices may have a partial and temporary effect, but no permanent progress can be made in settling this conflict without restraining and finally removing its cause. Its real central cause is an inordinate love of self and the world and that cause will continue to operate as long as it exists. It may be restrained and moderated, but it will assert itself when occasion offers. Every wise man must therefore seek to remove the cause, and as far as he can do it he will control effects. Purify the mountain, and you make the whole stream pure and wholesome. There is a principle of universal influence that must underlie and guide every successful effort to bring these two great factors of human good which now confront each other with hostile purpose, into harmony. It is no invention or discovery of mine. It embodies a higher than human wisdom. It is not difficult to understand or apply. The child can comprehend it and act according to it. It is universal in its application and wholly useful in its effects. It will lighten the burdens of labor and increase its rewards. It will give security to capital and make it more productive. It is simply the golden rule, embodied in these words. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Before proceeding to apply this principle to the case in hand, let me call your special attention to it. It is a very remarkable law of human life which seems to have been generally overlooked by statesmen, philosophers, and religious teachers. This rule embodies the whole of religion. It comprises all the precepts, commandments, and means of the future triumphs of good over evil, of truth over error, and the peace and happiness of men foretold in the glorious visions of the prophets. Mark the words. It does not merely say that it is a wise rule, that it accords with the principles of the divine order revealed in the law and the prophets. It embodies them all. It is the law and the prophets. It comprises love to God. It says we should regard him as we desire to have him regard us, that we should do to him as we wish to have him do to us. If we desire to have him love us with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, and with all his strength, we must love him in the same manner. If we desire to have our neighbor love us as he loves himself, we must love him as we love ourselves. Here, then, is the universal and divine law of human service and fellowship. It is not a precept of human wisdom. It has its origin in the divine nature and its embodiment in human nature. Now let us apply it to the conflict between labor and capital. You are a capitalist. Your money is invested in manufactures, in land, in mines, in merchandise, railways, and ships, or you loan it to others on interest. You employ, directly or indirectly, men to use your capital. You cannot come to a just conclusion concerning your rights and duties and privileges by looking wholly at your own gains. The glitter of the silver and gold will exercise so potent a spell over your mind that it will blind you to everything else. You can see no interest but your own. The laborer is not known or regarded as a man who has any interests you are bound to regard. You see him only as your slave, your tool, your means of adding to your wealth. In this light he is a friend so far as he serves you, an enemy so far as he does not. 
But change your point of view. Put yourself in his place. Put him in your place. How would you like to have him treat you if you were in his place? Perhaps you have been there. In all probability you have, for the capitalist today was the laborer yesterday, and the laborer today will be the employer tomorrow. You know from lively and painful experience how you would like to be treated. Would you like to be regarded as a mere tool, as a means of enriching another? Would you like to have your wages kept down to the bare necessities of life? Would you like to be regarded with indifference and treated with brutality? Would you like to have your blood, your strength, your soul coined into dollars for the benefit of another? These questions are easy to answer. Everyone knows that he would rejoice to be treated kindly, to have his interests regarded, his rights recognized and protected. Everyone knows that such regard awakens a response in his own heart. Kindness begets kindness. Respect awakens respect. Put yourself in his place. Imagine that you are dealing with yourself, and you will have no difficulty in deciding whether you should give the screw another turn, that you may wring a penny more from the muscles of the worker, or relax its pressure, and if possible, add something to his wages and give him respect for his service. Do to him as you would have him do to you in changed conditions. You are a laborer. You receive a certain sum for a day's work. Put yourself in the place of your employer. How would you like to have the men you employed work for you? Would you think it right that they should regard you as their enemy? Would you think it honest in them to slight their work, to do as little and to get as much as possible? If you had a large contract which must be completed at a fixed time or you would suffer great loss, would you like to have your workmen take advantage of your necessity to compel an increase of their wages? Would you think it right and wise in them to interfere with you in the management of your business? To dictate whom you should employ and on what terms you should employ them? Would you not rather have them do honest work in a kind and good spirit? Would you not be much more disposed to look to their interests, to lighten their labor, to increase their wages when you could afford to do so, and look after the welfare of their families when you found that they regarded yours? I know that it would be so. It is true that men are selfish and that some men are so mean and contracted in spirit that they cannot see any interest but their own, whose hearts, not made of flesh but of silver and gold, are so hard that they are not touched by any human feeling and care not how much others suffer if they can make a cent by it. But they are the exception, not the rule. We are influenced by the regard and devotion of others to our interests. The laborer who knows that his employer feels kindly toward him desires to treat him justly and to regard his good, will do better work and more of it, and will be disposed to look to his employer's interests as well as his own. I am well aware that many will think this divine and humane law of doing to others as we would have them do to us is impracticable in this selfish and worldly age. If both parties would be governed by it, everyone can see how happy would be the results. But, it will be said, they will not. The laborer will not work unless compelled by want. He will take advantage of every necessity. As soon as he gains a little independence of his employer, he becomes proud, arrogant, and hostile. The employer will seize upon every means to keep the workmen dependent upon him and to make as much out of them as possible. Every inch of ground which labor yields capital will occupy and entrench itself in it, and from its vantage bring the laborer into greater dependence and more abject submission. But this is a mistake. The history of the world testifies that when the minds of men are not embittered by intense hostility and their feelings outraged by cruel wrongs, they are ready to listen to calm, disinterested, and judicious counsel. A man who employed a large number of laborers in mining coal told me that he had never known an instance to fail of a calm and candid response when he had appealed to honorable motives, as a man to man, both of whom acknowledged a common humanity. There is a recent and most notable instance in this city of the happy effect of calm, disinterested, and judicious counsel in settling difficulties between employers and workmen that were disastrous to both. When the mind is inflamed by passion, men will not listen to reason. They become blind to their own interests and regardless of the interests of others. Difficulties are never settled while passion rages. They are never settled by conflict. One party may be subdued by power, but the sense of wrong will remain. The fire of passion will slumber, ready to break out again on the first occasion. But let the laborer or the capitalist feel assured that the other party has no wish to take any advantage, that there is a sincere desire and determination on both sides to be just and pay due regard to their common interests, 
and all the conflict between them would cease, as the wild waves of the ocean sink to calm when the winds are at rest. The laborer and the capitalist have a mutual and common interest. Neither can permanently prosper without the prosperity of the other. They are parts of one body. If labor is the arm, capital is the blood. Devitalize or waste the blood, and the arm loses its power. Destroy the arm, and the blood is useless. Let each care for the other, and both are benefited. Let each take the golden rule as a guide, and all cause of hostility will be removed. All conflict will cease, and they will go hand in hand to do their work and reap their just reward.